Look at the blood spatter. Prince? Bang, bang, bang. My name is Matthew Steiner. Matt Steiner is a senior crime scene analyst and veteran investigator of over 21 years. Today we're going to break down the portrayal of forensic science in TV and movies. As we're critiquing these clips, understand that their goal is to entertain, and they definitely do that. The Wire Trajectory Analysis. First off, the gun safety, and this was, uh, it was comical and not realistic. You wouldn't take a, a loaded weapon and start waving it around in a crime scene. Oh, oh, fuck. Initially, the original crime scene investigator on the scene should have took note of directionality. Motherfuck. We do that by looking at the concordial fracturing of glass to see which direction the force is going. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. So we would have known in this case originally that the bullet was coming from outside to the inside of the kitchen. So what they do from that point is they try to figure what would the trajectory line be from that bullet hole through our deceased body, which way was that bullet going? Fucking A. Lo and behold, there is the bullet in the door. Motherfucker. From that point, I think we deviate from reality. But we wouldn't just start picking at that hole. They could be destroying rifling that's on that bullet. And that's what really we're gonna send to the lab to do some sort of analysis compared to a suspect's gun. Motherfucker. NCIS Personal Protective Equipment. No rule number two is always wear gloves, but when there's this much blood... Rain gear. In the truck. So in this scene, uh, they actually talk about wearing personal protective equipment. Rain gear. Yet no one is wearing any sort of garb. What happened? Everyone is wearing just like a jumpsuit or their regular attire and just gloves. Basically, you would never want to do that. Well, apparently that one did. Beyond that, our crime scene technician, he's taking photographs. He then wipes his brow. Then he handles evidence. Basically what he's done, he's taken DNA that was on that camera, on his brow, and put it onto our evidence on the scene. And then proceeds to have a whole conversation while holding that evidence right by his face. Did you see The Counselor? That was a pretty good movie. Again, improper procedure for collection of DNA evidence. He could have been wearing a Tyvek suit, a mask. You may even want to wear goggles or glasses and multiple layers of gloves. Rule number two is always wear gloves. I would strip out the outer layer of glove, put another layer of gloves on top of it, and then proceed to collect evidence. I think I found that out, boss. Recovering evidence, Zodiac. Hey, okay, it looks like you wiped the cab down pretty good. We got some blood over here. Prince? Could very well be. Initial observations is that the vehicle might have been wiped down, which you can see sometimes with oblique lighting on a scene. You can see sometimes fingerprints. So. That's a pretty good observation. Thank you. As we proceed to the other side of the vehicle, there's a shell casing on the driver's side front floor, which wasn't marked or photographed as far as I could tell. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, things gotta be documented in situ or as is, as found. He just picks it up with a pen. Where has that pen been beforehand? You know, was it in your hand? Was it in your ear? Was it in your nose? Right here. You know, it's got DNA from who knows where. I don't know where this started. Unfortunately, I've seen this in real life. If anything, if this is like a PSA of what not to do at a crime scene, that's one of those big things you wouldn't want to do at a crime scene. I'm an idiot. Tire impression evidence, the flash. Getaway cars and Mustang Shelby GT500. Shelby's have a rear super wide tire specific to that model. 12 inches with an asymmetrical tread. I don't think anyone, just by looking at a tire impression to say it came from a specific vehicle. Sorry. We would do some sort of dental stone casting of that impression, recover it, send it to the lab. And then there's a database which they can search to say what sort of vehicles it could come from. There's something else. Thanks. And there's a pen again being used to collect evidence. My dad gave me that pen. Which is improper. Before he died. Another thing you wouldn't do is if anything is inside of our impression at our scene, we would leave it there. We would cast it in place. We wouldn't sample it because you could be destroying treadwear inside that impression. Yeah, yeah, I did. After he samples with the pen. Fecal excrement. Animal, I'd guess. I don't know how he would know the difference between human and animal feces, which I don't think is realistic. Uh, no. Loaded weapon. Examining a body. One raspberry, push up, one orange. So, what are we looking at here, Doc? The worst dressed stiff I've ever seen. The stiff and I pounded a beat together for five years. So, show some respect. So, it's common for TV and movies to present crime scene investigation in this fashion where we have 
all these different people doing a million different things all at once inside of a crime scene. That means it's working. We want that crime scene clear. We wouldn't want anyone in there except the people who are doing the investigation. In real life, not that we would make fun of someone who is dead. Show some respect. But there is a certain gallows humor that goes along with crime scene investigation and death investigation. And it's one of the ways to cope with it is to adopt this type of humor. <laughs> I know. Crime scene analysis as portrayed in Boondog Saints. You got any theories to go with that time? He was the only one done right. Double tap, back of the head. And the pennies? New hitman wants to leave his mark. That's a possibility. Another possibility is they were placed there with religious intent. In this scene, they focus too much on the why the crime happened. What is the symbolism there? Crime scene analysis usually deals with the who, the what, the where. Oh shit, I forgot about that one. The when, the how of something, but never the why. Kinda makes me feel like river dancing. The why has to do with motive, and there's no way that we can prove why with science. <laughs> Heat crime scene analysis. This guy here has got what appears to be a double tap entry wound to the sternum. Tattooing around the head wound, scorched bone, close range, probably executed. In this scene, we have our, I'm assuming he's a crime scene investigator. He makes uh, an assumption that a gunshot entry wound was at close range. Entry wound to the sternum, close range. We can make those um, determinations. When you fire a gun, besides the bullet that comes out of the barrel, we have burning and unburned gunpowder. What difference does it make? That burning gunpowder will go a certain distance. Bang. We then also have unburned gunpowder that goes a further distance to that. Bang. And then obviously the bullet goes the furthest distance. Bang, bang, bang. So we'll look at the injuries. We'll look at whether there is burning. And then we'll look for other things like stippling. And that is the abrasions caused by the unburnt gunpowder abrading the skin. Okay, what about them? Not having the weapon itself, you really couldn't say exactly, but we could take that weapon and the same ammunition, bring it to ballistics and do several test firings at different distances to replicate that pattern, to see if we get the same diameter of gunshot residue and burning. Rock and roll. Fingerprint evidence seven. Oh, man. Well, I can tell you guys, just by looking at the scroll pattern, not the victim's fingerprints. This is kind of overkill. It's probably because it looked cool is the reason they put the alternate light source in there with fluorescent powder. It really could have kept doing just regular black powder. Probably is what we would have done in the field. You're kidding me. It's like prescribing brain surgery for a headache. So many freaks out there. Beyond that, the techniques aren't that great because they're using too much powder and then they're using compressed air to blow out the friction ridge detail. We would never do that. Jody Foster told me to do it. Also, right here, he calls it a swirl pattern. Just by looking at the swirl pattern, swirl pattern. There's no such thing as a swirl pattern. There's arches, loops, and whirls. So there's some parts of this that are true, but a lot of it is fancy. The voices made me do it. Processing a vehicle, the other guys. We found a lot of stuff. From bodily fluid and hair samples, we determined that a bunch of old homeless dudes had an orgy in the car. Oh, God. So what they get right in the scene is that they're processing it indoors, they bring it to a garage, and that's what you want to do in real life. Yeah, and then to top it all off, some joker comes along. I think he knew you guys were cops, because this is what I would call a spite shit. Also, the attire of our crime scene technicians is correct. Oh, yeah. They're all wearing personal protective equipment, Tyvek suits, gloves, masks. Dirty Mike and the boys. Which is funny, it's a comedy, but they got it right. Found a deer vagina. The rest of it is just kind of silly and funny, determining, you know, that it was a uh, spite, spite shit. shit or that you know, there was a deer vagina. What? Or homeless guys had an orgy inside the car. It's just kind of funny, but very unrealistic. You turned my beautiful Prius into a nightmare. How to get away with murder, detecting latent blood. They didn't find anything. So in this clip, way too many people inside this crime scene, all doing random things at once, just like we saw with the loaded weapon clip. Some people have gloves on, some people don't. No one is wearing a Tyvek suit or booties. And probably the biggest cardinal sin is that we have the suspect inside the scene. How much longer? Yeah, you know, that's not reality at all. What? They start pulling out knives out of a knife block and they swab, but they swab one side of the blade, not the other side of the blade, nor do they swab the handle. Seems like a foolish move. The last step was to do luminol testing, and that's a chemical we use inside of crime scenes to look for latent blood. Everyone would have been cleared out of the room at that point is a possibility that luminol is carcinogenic, so you'd be wearing a mask as well as a Tyvek suit. Oh, you're being paranoid. But you know, they just start randomly spraying the chemicals and everyone else is around breathing it. That's a no-no. And maybe he's just being smart. He's also using some sort of UV light with it or some sort of blue light with it. Luminol, you don't need that. You don't need any sort of alternate light source. 
you just make the room dark, uh, you spray it in combination with hydrogen peroxide, and if there's a reaction, it will glow. I'm gonna run what's called a luminol test. So this is where they actually do get it right. Later on, he's called out for diluting the blood by spraying too much luminol. The more luminol you spray, the more you dilute the blood. In real life, we'd be very careful on how much of the chemical we're gonna add. There's other chemicals that will react in glow or chemiluminesce in reaction to luminol. Okay, all right, I get it. Ballistic and fingerprint analysis, The Dark Knight. That's brick underneath. Gonna take ballistics off a shattered bullet? No. Fingerprints. Recovery technique is pretty good. We would try to cut it out of the wall. This is your original scan. Here it is re-engineered. And there's the thumbprint he left when he pushed the round in the clip. Uh, this is completely impossible. Yeah. It's not based on any sort of science. Fair enough. The rifling inside the barrel is going to create markings on that bullet, which would have destroyed a fingerprint that was there anyway, let alone the extreme heat that would have burnt off most of the fingerprint. Good luck. Blood stain pattern analysis as portrayed in Dexter. The male victim was standing right here, and the killer plunged his knife into the shoulder, severing the carotid artery. And... Here in the scene, we have Dexter doing blood stain pattern analysis. Now over here, you have nice, clean sprays of blood. He gets the description and categorization of the blood stain patterns correct. Clean and easy. But that's really about it. <clears throat> First off, those types of patterns, you would never do that sort of reconstruction for. You would never do stringing for arterial gushing or, or cast off, because there's no way that you could figure out exactly where it came from. Dang. You never know. As opposed to some sort of impact spatter from a gunshot or, or from someone that was beaten with a bat. So we're looking for a sushi chef. It looks like just someone just took a bucket of red paint and threw it on one wall, and then someone kind of randomly squirted blood on another wall. So it's like a finger painting. Then the cast off, uh, they don't look realistic. They're a little more linear than that. They sometimes can be curvilinear depending on how you're moving your hand. But to say it definitely came from a sharp knife, not a sword, there's, there's not really any way to say the exact object that it came from. Yeah, sushi chef is possible. Insomnia, autopsy. Clear cause of death was herniation of the brain stem due to intracerebral hemorrhage. Beaten to death. These contusions? Superficial. Most of the trauma was to her face and the top of her neck. First off, what I don't like about the portrayal of this, which they do sometimes in these shows, is that someone's got to turn on a light. Not this time. You know, we'd want as much light as possible. Told you. It didn't appear that there was even an autopsy done. But there's gonna be. There was no Y incision on our deceased. So to say that the neck injury is superficial, superficial, how would you even know that without actually looking at it I don't know. to see how the far the tissue is damaged or if the hyoid bone was broken or fractured? Beaten to death. There's no way to know just by doing a visual inspection to see that sort of thing. Told you. Body gave us nothing. At the end, you know, he's handling the body, takes his gloves off and then touches her hair. She could be bleeding from the head and now you're taking your bare hand and touching her blood. Didn't even blink. And then maybe later on having a sandwich or whatever. So it's kind of ridiculous. This guy, he crossed the line. Crime scene assumptions, true detective. This is gonna happen again. This is his vision. Her body is a paraphilic love map. He might not have known her, but this idea goes way back with him. You get that from one of your books? I did. I gotta thank Woody Harrelson for this. He basically says what I'm gonna say anyway. You got a chapter in one of those books on jumping to conclusions. Anytime we start an investigation with an assumption or we come up with a theory. I guarantee this wasn't his first. We always have to be ready to abandon that theory. You attach an assumption to a piece of evidence, you start to bend the narrative to support it. What I like about this clip is that Woody Harrelson's character kind of stops. Which I got a problem with. Bone collector, collection of evidence. We're gonna need those handcuffs, Amelia. Well, then we can remove them when they get here. Look in the suitcase, there's a small saw. I want you to saw her hands off at the wrist line. We gotta have those cuffs for prints. This is not realistic at all. We would never destroy the body intentionally like that. It's true. To recover handcuffs, we would somehow get those removed. Saw off her hands. And she takes a couple seconds to try to remove them. They're stuck. So the next option is to cut off the victim's hands. I can't. No there's still gonna be blood that's gonna be coming out of the other end of that hand, which is gonna completely consume whatever DNA or fingerprints that would be on the handcuff. So, not a great option. Hey, why don't you knock it off, Link? I don't need to knock it off! Forensic Anthropology, Castle. Yo, this building was set to be demolished, that is, until the salvage crew stripping the place came across his body. 
buried under concrete, no less. You got cause of death? Not till I do a full exam, but he's probably been here since they poured the concrete back in 1978. Anything else you can tell us about the victim? He was maybe early 30s and a sharp dresser. Check out that powder blue suit. In this scene, they're able to somehow miraculously perfectly excavate this skeleton fully intact. Buried under concrete, no less. Unlikely. What? If you were to be breaking up concrete with sledgehammers or jackhammer, you would have already damaged it, probably crushed a ribcage, if not a bunch of the bones. I know who the victim is. What? Beyond that, to give it a general age estimation, I think that is possible. He was maybe early 30s. Your skeleton is going to age in a very predictable manner. I am intrigued. So that's what they look for, certain growth and then deterioration of bone. And a testament to the truly indestructible nature of polyester. Early forensic investigations in cold blood. Did you find any shell casings? Nope. Which means it. You can bet they didn't leave any fingerprints either. First off, we can note that they're not wearing any sort of personal protective equipment. Oh. We wouldn't want to just take powder and just pour it onto a surface and then dust that powder around. Madman. We would take that powder and put it onto a separate clean surface that's not related to the scene at all. Stupid. Other than that, they make an assumption that casings were cleaned up somehow or picked up. Any shell casings? Nope. Could have been a revolver. Semi-automatic, automatic weapon. Casing's gonna be ejected out of the side of that weapon, but a revolver, that casing's gonna stay inside. So that would be the reason why you might not have a shell casing at the scene. Probably. Criminal Minds, Crime Scene Analysis. Jane Burney and Vinnie Dev were here. Jane tried to run, Vinnie didn't. How do you know? She's half under her desk which means she tried to hide the unsub founder. One of the worst things you could do as a crime scene investigator is to lose your objectivity. What if she was just sitting at the desk? Is that the position she died in? Maybe she crawled to her desk? So these three were stabbed and the rest were shot to death. They also make an assumption that we have one unknown subject or, or killer as opposed to two. Have you considered two killers? Yes, but the bloody footprints all seem to come from the same pair of shoes. It's possible that someone else didn't step in blood, right? Yes. Or that they both wore the same pair of shoes. We see this a lot. You would have to recover those shoe wear impressions and analyze them in the lab, which is a quick visual analysis, couldn't give you that information. Evidence at a crime scene, Family Guy. And now, back to Jake and the Fat Man. Hey, look over here on the carpet. That's a cigarette butt. This is probably evidence. Yeah, well, can you bring it over to me? I can't move it. This is a crime scene. So what we see in here is the typical chalk outline where the body was. It's iconic. Well, can you describe it to me? But it's a joke. No one does that anymore. You're destroying evidence. You could be adding chalk on top of DNA that could be important or other trace evidence that could be important. You know what? Forget it. Iron Man 3, the use of virtual reality in crime scene analysis. The heat from the blast was in excess of 3,000 degrees Celsius. Any subjects within 12.5 yards were vaporized instantly. No bomb parts found in a three-mile radius of the Chinese theater. No, sir. This is something that could happen, maybe not to that extent that we see in Iron Man 3, but there is current research in the use of virtual reality and augmented reality to help assist crime scene investigators. Talk to me, Happy. So if we document our scene with a three-dimensional laser scanner, the laser scanner is gonna collect millions and millions of points of data, and we'd be able to see anything that's in the view of that scanner. That. At the end, we wind up with a three-dimensional model. We could then take ourselves virtually through VR technology place ourselves in a scene to make observations. And those are the observations that we'd use for a reconstruction. Where is evidence? What's the context of this evidence? What happened and what order did things happen? Lots of pageantry going on here, lots of theater. Minority Report, predictive crime analysis. Time horizon, 12 minutes. All right, what he's doing now, we call scrubbing the image, looking for clues as to where the murder's gonna happen. Beyond that, the date of the crime, all we have to run on are the images that they produce. So in this movie, we see our precogs, our psychics, producing images of crimes that haven't happened yet. The precogs can see a murder four days out. Now, I don't think that that is ever possible, <laughs> but there is cutting edge research and technology that does help us identify crimes in progress. Oh, this is good. One of those technologies is what's called Shot Spotter that identifies audio from gunshots and specific to gunshots happening in certain areas and giving it a GPS location. It's a park. Dutch police are using augmented and virtual reality to go back and look at crime scenes in the past to help in their analysis and reconstruction. Conclusion. With the increased popularity of these types of shows, the public's perception has been affected by it, both in positive and negative ways. On the positive side, we have more people coming into the field and more attention is being given to forensic science. On the negative side, things are always shown in absolutes. The timeline of analysis is not true and not correct. 
techniques and technology that's just not even scientifically valid and does not exist. Now I understand that the goal of this is strictly for entertainment uh, and it does that. 